Let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, our first speaker and our uh, 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 and his moderator. Uh, Marcus Hartung uh, is uh, a guy who I think to anyone who follows uh, our, our industry needs very little introduction, uh, but let me provide a little one. Um, he is one of those um, uh, people in uh, the academy who has really sort of bridged the divide between the marketplace and the academy. And I think it's fair to say, Marcus, that you have focused on, you know, sort of ways of, of narrowing that divide in a very, uh, you know, thoughtful um, yet very practical kind of a way. Uh, Marcus uh, was a uh, small, uh, uh, a small firm lawyer. Um, he's been a mediator. He's been a large firm partner and managing partner. Um, he's an international speaker. He is the author of uh, a great book. Give a plug, Marcus. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I, I wanted to do it later. Oh, you'll do it later. OK, good. Uh, that has a new international edition coming out. Um, he really he speaks uh, around the world. And uh, he always speaks and thinks uh, very thoughtfully. Um, Leslie is going to be his moderator. Uh, I'm sure that everyone in the Northwestern community knows her well. Um, she is the one person who, in a first meeting I had, absolutely almost left me speechless, but um, I have great respect for what she's doing. She's, she's uh, taking the lead on a very innovative program here at Northwestern that I think you know, is, is important, not just in the States, but you know, I think globally in terms of what Leslie is trying to do. Um, essentially finding, I think, is this fair, uh, Leslie, trying to you know, sort of really tap into people with STEM backgrounds um, and, and you know, sort of really leveraging that background to make an impact in terms of um, you know, the, the, the new uh, legal services industry. Um, and so she's doing a great job, and I think she's a great person to pair with Marcus. So without further ado, Marcus, take it away. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, don't forget to tweet all this, <laughs> please. We never forget that. We had, a, <laughs> we had a good, I think we had a good outcome yesterday yes. with more than 100 tweets. Yeah. Right. Um, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak about four topics, basically four topics. This is, you know, the title of this is Surviving in Tough Times, People, Technology, Innovation. So I'm going to speak about four topics. One is tough times. So are we really living in tough times? And from what perspective you would like to uh, uh, judge on this? And then we talk briefly about people, then technology, uh, and then innovation. And uh, as a sort of health warning, this is coming from a more or less German background. Um, so, please, always with a pinch of salt, what I say may not apply to this wonderful country or to any of these 50 wonderful countries. Bear in mind, there is another world out there where things are just different, although we are talking about a global issue. Um, okay. Um, let, let's start. Are we living in tough times? Is it really the case that we live in tough times? And is it tough for lawyers? Is it tough for in-house legal departments, for companies, for students, for I don't know what? And how do we look at it? And what are the data and criteria we want to take to place our judgment on? Let's start with the Georgetown report. I'm sure you all know the Georgetown report, and in case not, I would encourage you to go to the internet and download the yearly Georgetown report, because it is a great piece of work providing all sorts of data on the legal profession. And for this year, or for last year, it has a certain pessimistic stance. If you read it, you think, oh my god, why did I choose this profession? So what does the Georgetown report say? It's really tough because the demand is flat since 2010. A bit better for the MLAW 100, but overall it's flat. No growth. Um, productivity, the Georgetown report understands productivity by the number of built hours. Um, on a downward scale, 
law firm increased their rates year on year, but the realization on rates is on a downward scale. Expenses are up, profit margin is down. Um, this report is headlined, The Lure of Failing Strategies, and interestingly, Georgetown compares that what law firms are doing by means of setting up a new strategy to find new growth and, and a safe place for the next three to five years. Georgetown report compares it with the French efforts following the First World War, before the Second World War, when they built up the Ligny Maginot. I'm sure you all know what it is. It is what it was a defense line at the border to Germany. You know, France and Germany have not always been best friends, and in First World War in particular. And, and France erected this defense line expecting that a next war, no one knew that the Second World War would come. And that was at a time when world wars didn't carry any numbers. You know, you had this war from 14 to 18, and France thought, with this Maginot line, we will keep the Germans away. They have to come via the Netherlands, and we will fight them there. And this Maginot line consisted of stone, of just, you know, barriers, like closed doors. No one thought about airplanes at that time. And Georgetown says, if we look at the strategy of law firms, it reminds us very much to that what France did following the First World War, because they could only imagine that the next war would be um, an exact copy of the First War. They could not imagine that, an, that a second war would look different, with different stances, different attitudes, different weapons. So France defended itself for a continuing First World War. And Georgetown says that is exactly what's happening in the legal profession. As um, law firms look at the big financial crisis back in 2007, 2008, and prepare themselves for a second financial crisis. And they don't realize that the next crisis will be something completely different. So their defense strategy is the Maginot Line. And the Maginot Line didn't help at all. In 1941, Germany just ran over the Maginot Line and came with all their airplanes with their Blitzkrieg. And they just, the rest is history. Uh, no one is proud of that. It's just making my point, And that's what Georgetown says. So that seems to be the situation, um, according to the Georgetown report. Now, in Germany, I said Germany is different. We analyzed the performance of the top 30 German firms year on year. And why top 30? Because that is a group which doesn't show much change. It's always the same firms. They change places, but basically it's the same group. And we use indexed figures just to analyze growth. And we focus on four sets of data. Turnover, number of people, number of equity partner, productivity. Productivity by means of uh, revenue per lawyer. And what is, what is clearly to be seen is that since 2002, the performance of the German top 30 is growing and growing and growing. Of course, there was a dip during the financial crisis, that is in 2009. But since then, the performance is again growing. And it's not only growing on turnover. There are more people. There are more equity partners. And if you look at the green line, the green line is Revenue per lawyer. It was sort of stagnating since 2007, 2008, but it's now higher than the pre-crisis revenue per lawyer. So tough times for top 30 companies. Maybe that's not the, the proper diagnosis. But you could say, OK, that's top 30. Like the MLaw 100, they are better off than other firms. So let's look at the so-called Mittelstands firms. Mittelstands firms are small to medium uh, firms, not global, independent, no UK or US management, um, inflexible, not innovative, um, typical partnerships, and so on. So in three words, a typical German law firm. But if you look at their performance and their revenue per lawyer, RPL growth, from last year, you see just growth. These law firms are growing. There are many reasons for, for it, why these law firms can improve their performance. But what I want to say is to say it's tough 
is maybe not so, it's, it's not so easy to say that. So what we did away from Germany, back to the global scale, since 2007, we have looked at a certain group of law firms to see how they have changed their performance over the years. And this is a, uh, we started on a McKinsey analysis. And at that time, the good old days in 2007, the legal market, global legal market, had five groups of law firms. Group A, the Wachtels and so, high premium, very profitable, uh, transaction focused, you know, all the, what, what they do. Then on the uh, group E, the large firms, the Baker McKenzie's of this world, DLA Piper, with a completely different strategy. Then you have the group D that was um, uh, the magic circle, the, uh, uh, the English magic circle, plus Latham and Skadden. And then group B and group C, um, firms, you know all the names, with, with interesting decisions to be taken as regards to which way to choose for further growth. So that was our starting point. We translated that in a different picture now to see how these groups of firms have moved and we had a certain thesis. We said the rich firms will be richer, the large firms will be larger, and the firms in the middle will come under severe pressure and will over time leave that segment. That was our assumption. So let's see whether we were right. In 2013, the picture hasn't changed that much. The rich firms are still unchanged, and the large firm have grown larger. And in the middle, it seems as if there would be a merger of Group B and Group C. So as a consequence of the financial crisis, many firms have said, come on, let's go to the Wachtel segment. Let's focus on premium client, premium work, let's work on our profitability, increase our profit per partner. That was their strategy. Remember the Maginot line. Uh, to be, you know, to be away from any crisis because we are so premium. That was 2013. Now what happens in 2017, the group E, the big firms, are even big, uh, growing bigger, and the rich firms, look at group A, where they are, they are getting richer. But it seems that one part of our prediction has not been right, and that's the group in the middle, these group B and C. So we thought, let's look closer to it. And we found out that if you look closer to this group of firms, our prediction um, is true because there is a group of firm, that is group B, which is following the very profitable route up to the um, um, Krabath and Wachtel and Slaughter and Mayer, these types of firms. And there are some other firms, the group C, these green dots, I don't know whether you can see that, they will over time probably um, leave that market. And that is the comparison from 2007 to 2017. What, I'm, what I want to say is that, of course, things have changed. But basically, that what the Georgetown report is saying is not yet true. It may become true in a couple of years, but at the moment, things haven't really changed. Other than the rich have been richer, the bigger have been bigger, and in the middle, well, that's normal. So what do, us, what do these numbers tell us? We see an American lawyer in Legal Week, in the lawyer, all these rankings, these profitability rankings. What do they tell us? Actually, nothing. Because... In this group of what is known as legal market, some companies are missing because they are not taking into account alternative service providers, spin-offs, other types of service providers who do not fit into the structure of a pure partnership, traditional way of doing legal services. That what Mark very often <laughs> describes as how legal services have been delivered in the old days. So, the traditional ways of looking at the successes of legal market and the successes of law firm um, are no longer helpful. So, so, but if you're a managing partner and, and, and you go to a consultant and want to have advice for how to further develop, what are the key points you should focus on? And that, these are maybe my, my point I would give to him, focus on people, focus on innovation, focus on technology, 
um, if I don't mention clients, that goes without saying. But the first point is, are we living in tough times? Actually, it depends a bit, and we don't know really. And this Georgetown report is a great piece to read, and I really do encourage you to do that. But don't think that this really reflects the market of legal service providers. There is only one exemption. That is this slide, also from a Thomson Reuters report. That shows how alternative service providers have taken over and how they have gained market share in the world. David, I'm surprised that you are taking a photo. I mean, this is your graph. It's 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 <laughs> <laughs> are you double checking whether I have changed something there? Rest I assured, I didn't. <laughs> what you, but you know, the legal market is full of legal service providers who are not law firms. And they have huge market shares. And only some law firms are there with their captive, with their own LPOs, legal, uh, legal uh, process outsourcing provider. But that's only a small bit. So these, non, these um, alternative service providers are active in the market, but they are not taken into account in the rankings of uh, MLaw 100, 200, MLaw, you name it all. It seems to be two worlds, two worlds where we look at. And therefore, we can't say, is it tough or not? Right, that's it. Now, people, innovation, and technology, these are now sketches from our research we do at Bucerius Law School, people. Yesterday, we, we, we talked quite a lot about people and why people are so resistant to change, and lawyers in particular, and, and, and why it is so difficult to deal with law firms. Um, <coughs> now, <coughs> I have the privilege um, to work for Bucerius, and this is a copy from a magazine which dealt with German's top lawyers. And there was an article on Bucerius, and it was said, here, studieren die Besten. So the best students are here. Um, and I don't comment on that. It's, I, I think it's true. Um, and we look at these people and see how their personality traits develop. And we interview them. Because we want to understand what drives them, what drives students to go to such a law firm, and how, uh, sorry, to such a law school, and what are their future plans, how do they see life, what is important for them, what are their values. And we interview international students each year from uh, late summer to December, a large group of international students from universities all over the world come to Hamburg and study there. And I teach their management and leadership classes. And we interview them. We do surveys and so just to better understand how this new generation of lawyers develops. And interestingly is that things seem to change. This is a graph showing our tradition, how we look at lawyers. That's the famous Larry Richards herding cats research. Have you heard of that? What makes it so different with lawyers? So he, he, he compared lawyers with the general public. And the general public on this graph is always 50. So with regard to skepticism, the assumption is 50% of the general population is very skeptical and 50% are not. That's, that's his assumption. Then he compares personality traits of lawyers. So lawyers are very skeptical. I mean, that's part of their job. And they have a high sense for autonomy. That means don't even think of trying to manage me. You know, that means high sense for autonomy. They have a lack of resilience. Interestingly, lawyers, lawyers who think they are great guys, they are not resilient. That means they are risk averse because they can't bounce back. They are, they are not sociable. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> and they have this sense of urgency. Of course, if you, if you have a new assignment for a lawyer, what he does, he from A to B, give me my resources, and then get out of my way, and he gets it done. That's a sense of urgency. Don't get in his way with admin stuff, like conflict check and the paperwork. Don't do that. So that is how we look at lawyers. And therefore, we say it's impossible to manage law firms. It's like herding cats. Now, we have looked at these young people, and the world looks different with these guys. Look, they are skeptic, but not to that extent from Larry's research with lawyers. They also have a high sense of urgency, but they are very sociable. 
Look at this. Look at these young people, how they perform against the traditional laws of these old days. And they have a high sense of resilience, and the international students even more so. Because what do they do? They leave their home country and their university and come to Hamburg to study there. These are special types of people. That's not, you know, born in a West family and go to a law school and then go to a law firm and not leave your country and think that that's the world. So maybe that's a reason for not being resilient. Um, and they have a sense of autonomy, but not as high as theirs. So it may well be that the next generation of people is different and you can achieve other things than you can achieve with the typical type of lawyers. Now we have looked at all the criteria of Larry's uh, study and have applied it to these young people. What they don't have is ego drive and aggressiveness. That is very um, hardly existing. But they have a high sense for thoroughness, flexibility, idea orientation. They have an idea more than earning money, empathy, risk-taking, and so on. So that is the next generation of people, and that is on their top 10 list. Why do they study law? What moves them forward? And it's very much make the world a better place. I have heard that the CIA says the same thing, right? Is it, is it the case? That, but that what they want to achieve is make the world a better place, law for good. Now, this is, of course, I'm not criticizing Larry, not at all. What I'm saying is that there is a new generation of people with a new set of values, and maybe law firms will look different. But there is a but. Larry analyzed full-blown lawyers. We analyze young students. And this is not a longitudinal study. So we don't see how values develop over time. Maybe this is fragile. Maybe these people add a bit of law school debt and add a bit of money from law firm, and maybe they change all of a sudden. Maybe some of these values just go away um, because US students in this, perform, in, in, in this research perform differently. For them, money plays a bigger role, which is natural. I mean, what's the amount of money they, they have when they leave law school? 130,000 yeah. US dollars. You are not surprised that they are interested in a high salary. OK, so that is what we're actually doing with people. And what are we doing with this research? We are, of course, continuing this research. We are talking to law firms. We're trying to set up new performance and appraisal models with law firms to appraise those things law firms really want to achieve with their people and where these people are good at. So long with people. As I said, just sketches from Germany. The world may be completely different in the United States or in Asia. Innovation. We have talked a lot about innovation yesterday. And for some time, it, it, it seemed to me that it was impossible to use the term innovation without the word disruptive. And it is as if people take pride and joy in destroy things. Innovation, yeah. And you know what happens? Innovation scares people. That is the consequence. The function of innovation is to better society, to make our lives better. Why do we invent machines? Because we want to replace people? No, that's not the purpose of inventing a machine. It's to help them not to do a job which ruins their health at their 40s and brings them to the grave at their 50s. That's the role of innovation. But we have a means of presenting innovation of something which frightens people. You are being replaced by technology and innovation. And we take Uber as the role model for innovation. And, and these are pictures which show you the Luddites of today. You know, you have an impression how it looked like when the weavers, the Luddites, ran against the machines. And what is Uber? Uber is an idea and technology. It's shed loads of money. And it's a very bold interpretation of existing rules. So uh, or it, maybe it's disregarding the rules. That is innovation, how we understand it today. And I'm not surprised that people are frightened by that. So if we don't look at innovation in a holistic way, like, like, like Jude did it yesterday, 
There is no innovation without getting the people on your side and then change things. But just to change things and don't care about the people, it doesn't work. So that frightens people. And the interesting thing is, we don't know anything about the consequences of, of innovation. Even the inventors don't. And that is my point we have to bear in mind. You know, remember 2007, January 2007, this, this iconic presentation of the first iPhone. If you haven't seen it, look at it. It's great. It's, it's, it's a moment in history. And, and Steve Jobs raised this thing and said, Apple has reinvented the phone. Apple has reinvented the phone. Guys, who is using this thing as a telephone today? I. You know, <laughs> vintage 57. But my 15-year-old my daughter, she does everything with it, and she communicates like hell. And she says, well, sometimes daddy calls me, but I always miss his calls, I don't need it. She doesn't use it as a telephone. So what, what I'm, and, and there is this famous tweet from 2016, written in emojis, completely new. In less than 10 years, the iPhone replaced all sorts of applications. In 2007, no one had an idea of what the iPhone could do, leave alone that the iPhone has changed the way we communicate, we move, we behave to each other, and what, what we do all day. It has completely changed our life. But even Steve Jobs had no idea what that would mean. He knew that he presents something which was gorgeous and new and cool. But he didn't know that he really changed the world at that moment. And there is one evidence for that. What is really innovative with the iPhone is not just the device. The device is new and cool and interesting. It's the platform. It's the platform. The iPhone is a platform bringing app producer and customers together. And Apple earns 30% of each app which is sold. And the Apple Store, the, 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 sorry, the App Store was um, introduced in July 2008. Steve Jobs was against it. So the real innovation, even Steve Jobs had no idea what it meant. So, and what are we doing with this in Germany, in our little town? We say, okay, as we don't know what happens with innovation and what the future will bring, let's do it by ourselves. Um, I thought this quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln in a city like Chicago is appropriate. So the best way to predict it is to create it. What did we do? We have entered into a joint initiative with Baker McKenzie, Bosch, Daimler, Walters Klüver, and ZF. ZF is one of the big automotive supplier. Then three startups and um, a group of students, the, the Legal Tech Lab. And we have, set, we have founded the first innovation hub. It needs a name. And this is a place where clients and law firms get together and start to just to test new ways of working with startup people who do not just invent sexy applications for no one, which, which are b b because they, they don't have any sales policy. They develop their tools together with clients and with law firms. And why is it Baker McKenzie and not any other firm? Because the chief uh, strategy officer of Baker McKenzie is the former dean of Ibn Sirius Law School. So it's always people having an idea and then bringing institutions together. And that's the reason why Butzerius is part of, the, of this uh, enterprise, because we think only in that way, by getting people together and developing new ways of working, we can get people on our side and support what we are doing with innovation. And now comes technology. So when, when innovation frightens people, technology drives us mad. If, if you look at the discussion about technology and legal tech, it's like a BMW. It's purely driven by emotion. This is a discussion which is completely free of facts. It's even not based on alternative facts. It's free of facts. It's purely driven of opinion and emotion. I take the view that in three years, 50% of you will be replaced by computers. And if you would ask, do you have any facts, or you know, how, how do you come to this view? He would say, yeah, that's my opinion. So this, de this debate is terrible. And of course, 
it frightens people again. It brings people up against technology. Although technology should be something which helps us to do a better job, to live better, to move better, to work better, to have a better interface to our clients, that's the role what technology should have. And we look at technology rather hostile. So Abuzerius has done uh, commissioned two studies. One study, that is the how legal technology will change the business of law, uh, is available in the internet. The other one is an internal study, just to find out what are the, what is the impact technology really has. And today, you will be surprised there is an impact, but it's not disruptive. It's not revolutionary. It's, it's one of these small innovation which improves things. And it, it may develop further, but at the moment, it's, it's slowly moving. But still, sorry, um, German lawyers, this, and, and confronted with this way of discussing things, have this German angst. 44% of German lawyers think technology is a bad thing. It's only good for the non-lawyer competition. The rest, the further, say, open-minded law firms think, OK, technology is something we could use for cost-cutting, develop new products, improve their performance. It's a very shaky picture at the moment. Um, and what we have done now, this is, <laughs> we, we, the last year we, we brought a book to the market on all these related issues. And the good thing is people are nervous. It's good for your sales, I have to say that. Um, so it's now the number one bestseller. And, and you can't imagine how proud I am that Three authors of the international edition, which is about to come to the market in September, are in this room. It's uh, Mark Cohn, it's David Kern, and Dan Linner. And, and Mark, as usual, counts double because he has written two chapters. So, watch this. The first one wasn't good enough. You didn't <laughs> <see>. <laughs> what, what, watch this, watch this space um, when this book comes. But what I'm going to say, legal tech or technology, what's the fuss about it? Why are we so excited when it comes to, to legal technology or technology? So the good thing with technology is it has brought our attention to the way how legal services can be provided and should be provided today. So technology is a sort of driver to move our thinking, to think about the business of law and the practice of law and the differences of that. But it's not technology as such. There is a certain hype which is not helpful. So many people think digital transformation would be to digitize traditional workflows. That is not digital transformation. And just to buy software has nothing to do with digitalization. That is the difficult point of it. But we have started to think about it. And I think we are expecting interesting times because the way legal services are produced together with other people, and then delivered to uh, clients will be even completely different from that what we think today in modern role model law firms uh, where we think they are really innovative. We haven't really tested that. With we, I am talking of law firms. Now, um, finally, good news for law firms. Law firms are not per se innovative. They are not. Why should they? They are innovative when they are driven by their clients. Now, good news is clients consist of lawyers. And lawyers and clients, in-house legal departments, oh my god, they are so lagging behind. They are so uninnovative. There may be some exemptions of the rule. But overall, there has been a survey of the Harvard Business Review recently published, and it shows in-house legal departments have no clue what is coming up to them. They, have no, they say, yes, we know we have to do something next year or so. And we have tested one tool. That was great. So that, that's the way how they move to it. For that time, it's good for law firms because they don't have to change. That's good news for law firms. Um, and this is basically it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Really interesting, lots to talk about there. I'm just gonna ask a couple of general questions and then we'll uh, see where people wanna go with it. 
Um, I know that you're the director of the Butseres uh, Center on the Legal Profession. Can you say a little bit about what the center does yeah. and how it might compare to centers here in the U.S. at Harvard, Stanford, Georgetown? Okay. Um, I mean, Harvard and, and Stanford also have a center on the legal profession. Um, the, the, the special thing is, Butzerius is a law school like, like Northwestern or like any other law school. The difference in Germany is that it's the only privately funded law school. All other law schools are at universities and are publicly funded. And uh, Butzerius always took the view that although their core business is to train students to their first exam, and this is it for law schools, they said we have to pursue the concept of lifelong learning. So our students have to, have to keep on learning of what the profession expects from them. Um, so uh, Butzerius has an um, executive education arm, so Butzerius provides training to lawyers, to in-house legal, uh, uh, to, to in-house lawyers, and then, in, back in 2009, we thought that just to offer training courses is not enough because there are so many providers of training courses. And we said, if we really want to be forward and set up ourselves from the competition, we need an institute which does research and writes studies and um, gives lectures and interviews people and is the point to go if you have a question as regards to legal markets. And that's the Buteria Center on the Legal Profession. So if someone has a question in, in Germany or in German-speaking countries, they very often turn to us. Um, and that was our, our goal. And th that is special as it is no legal professorship what I have. So in Germany, you should not call me professor because I'm, I'm not a legal professor. Um, th that's, that's the German end of it. I, uh, from the uh, chart that you showed, it looks like the Buseria students are really resilient and um, sociable. Do they come to you that way, or do you guys do something special to well, bring up those numbers? The good thing with Buseria is um, that it has a competitive advantage to, to other universities. Other universities don't have any tests when students come. They just look at their, at their uh, Abitur, which is A grade. Uh, while Butzerius um, has tests and look, looks at the personality, um, so these are people who are not just good pupils, that is one point. Many of them play an instrument or have some social engagement or are just more rounded personalities. Uh, and that is one point. And I, you know, if you would say, well, Butzerius students are different, it's because we have the privilege to pick and choose. Um, if other universities would do that as well, probably the number of law students would dramatically uh, decrease. We have 800 applicants each year, and we take only 112. So, and it's a privilege. Sounds like it. Um, you uh, talked a little bit towards the end about the legal tech scene. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with legal tech in Germany and how that compares to other countries? Yeah. Um, the, the legal tech scene in Germany is, um, I, I would say, okayish compared to other countries. It's, for example, Austria is further developed, France is far more innovative, uh, leave alone the UK, um, but we often divide between UK and the rest of Europe. So in, in Germany, we have a number of platforms. Um, we, have a, we have a very vivid AI scene which has not yet developed the legal sector bar one application which is a document review um, application called Leverton. Andrew, you probably know that. That's something like Kira or Luminance only for the real estate sector. And it was some groundbreaking, uh, today I would say it's a, it's a market leading standard application for document review in real estate transactions. Um, the, the issue with legal tech is that the legal environment is rather hostile. That You can compare that with the United States. So um, there are many uh, claims based on uh, unauthorized practice of law because the federal bar takes the view that um, services like of LegalZoom coming out of a machine are regarded as legal services 
and should be regulated by the bar. We think it should be regulated to make clear to people that that what is coming from the machine is something which is coming from the machine, but it's not legal service. So the regulation should be different. And uh, that, that, is, that is an issue for startup companies because investors are hardly available for an environment which is legally unclear. So some, some, of the, some similar issues to here in other countries. Um, you talked about legal tech not being about digitization. Where do you think the market is developing? Um, in particular, do you share the same view that was raised yesterday by Eva and John about great times ahead, golden age? Golden age. Well, um, I have, I have a, I, I see it slightly different. I see that the amount of legal or compliance issues is not decreasing, it is increasing. The world is getting more complicated. And what Johan showed yesterday, the amount of regulation he has to comply with, I mean, it's a nightmare. And it's not getting better. With this new GDPR in Germany, things are really getting complicated. So with regard to the amount of legal issues and legal nuts to be cracked, great news, but there is a but. The but is the number of lawyers understood by people who went through law school, leave law school with a debt burden of more than 100,000 euro, being admitted to the bar, I'm not sure that we really need more lawyers. We will need more people to deal with legal issues, trained for certain issues, and to be augmented by technology. But you know, you don't need to go to law school and have a full-blown law school to sort of deal with document review applications or do certain compliance things. So lawyers today have a certain uh, salary level, and we will have more people also in law firms which ha will have lower salary level and which will not carry the title of lawyer because um, it's not necessary to be a to be a lawyer. And that is my concern. So if we don't differentiate between the different legal roles, paralegals, um, a data analysts, project manager, process managers, lawyers, uh, barristers, people who go to court, if we don't do that, as a law school, for example, we, um, we would fool ourselves. So I'm not as optimistic. I'm optimistic as regards to the amount of work we have to deal with. But to the number of lawyers, highly paid lawyers, I'm a bit skeptical. So maybe a silver age, something like that. <laughs> All right, we're going to open it up. Start here with Mark. Um, just to that point, Marcus, um, I'd like to ask you, um, how would you today, given the statement you just made in terms of the future, what, what, is, how, what is a functional definition of a lawyer looking, let's say, three years, five years into the future as we start to maybe more closely parallel the medical industry where you, you, of course you still have physicians, but they are functioning very differently than they used to? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, today, I would say what lawyers should do is they take their knowledge and they take their experience and transform it into value added to clients. So that's that's basically what lawyers should do. Not just experience and not just knowledge, it's, 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 the, it's the mixture. And what is it in the end what lawyers should do? They should provide relief to clients. Now coming from that, so relief by means of there is someone who takes care of an issue I have and I don't know how to deal with it. And now let's assume it's a legal issue. Um, now, coming from that end to provide relief is something which requires empathy, the ability to understand how people react and other people on the other side react, and to be very creative in, in difficult and unclear and ambiguous environments. And that on the base of a very solid legal knowledge and there will always be a place for lawyers doing exactly this. But the, you know, the amount of cases um, or matters for the number of lawyers we have today, uh, that, that is the point which makes me skeptical. And 
from my slides where I, 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 I showed you how these segments on the legal markets move, the strategy at the moment to say either we grow like hell, like the Dentons and DLA, which is a completely sound strategy, it's a very sound strategy in, in uncertain times, you can't do that organically. So you have to, you have to know, like Dentons is doing it. The other way up the market to say we will only focus on very high class, premium, profitable work, question is, for how many high-class Wachtels and Hengelers and Slaughters and May is their place in this market? Because this market is not free of commoditization. That I would say. But still, like a, like, a, like a doctor who provides relief to a patient, even if he tells him, you are going to die, um, then you can provide relief by accompanying someone. So it's not that dramatic with lawyers. But you know, to tell someone that it's a serious situation, you may lose this case, but I will help you through this process by making use of all means, technical and non-lawyer resources to help you through this, and I will stand by your side, and that's what a lawyer should do. You mentioned the non-lawyer competition in Germany. So what is it, how does that shape up? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, Germany has a very far-reaching lawyer monopoly. So the definition of that, what only lawyers may do, is very broad. It says every individual case where the law has to be applied, that has to be done through a lawyer. Um, and of course, there are certain companies who try to find loopholes. And there is this, this law regulating access to the market, which allows for so-called debt collection companies, in Kassel firms. Uh, that they get an admission to, to act even if they are not lawyers. Now, many of these startup companies who help customers to regain their money, like, like flight rights, so um, uh, compensation if, you're, if your plane is late, or if your landlord um, have, has claimed too much rent, and so they find certain loopholes to act like debt collection agencies, and that works for a certain extent. But someone like uh, Joshua Browder with his do not pay would be illegal in Germany. So these chatbots providing help to immigrants, which is not collecting money, but helping to which administration you have to go and all these things, that would be illegal when it doesn't come from a lawyer. And lawyers don't do that because they are not there where the immigrants are. And they don't invest in setting up platforms where immigrants can just log in and in their home language, in Syrian, ask a question, how do I get, say, financial help and all these things. That doesn't exist. So we have a situation in Germany where access to law for those who really, really need it is just not there. We think legal tech companies could provide it. And the federal bar is taking a different view on that. So let's wait and see. That's very much in, um, that's, that's moving, but very slowly moving. Look, there is a question over there. Well, and David, we'll go here. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, I want to continue on the theme of uh, picking apart uh, Germany specifically. Uh, one thing that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> exploring <laughs> Germany a little bit. We talked about some limitations uh, like those of regulatory scheme you just talked about. Um, but what's the role of scale in, in uh, developing legal tech in a place like Germany? Yeah. Germany is not a small country, it's the biggest economy in Europe, but it is much smaller than the United States or the UK yeah. or other legal markets. How, Actually, how yeah. does the, you know, since this is a global conference, how does, how does a country the size of Germany approach legal tech? Can, can you really achieve the, 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 the type of scale you need to, no. to successfully build? No. Look, there are only three countries in the world where people speak German. That is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and this is it. Um, and of course, it's a small market. We, we still have many startup companies because many of these founders don't give it a damn when they start, whether it's a big market or not. They have an idea and they work on that idea and they don't think about sales and growth and these things. When they want to grow and looking for venture capital, they realize it's a very tough business. So um, as long as 
Germany is not willing to move to, like the Netherlands, to an English-speaking environment, which is starting at the moment in courts, that certain chambers at courts um, do their processes in English. For that time, the German market is difficult, and Europe is difficult. Europe for, for legal tech startups is difficult because read papers from the EU Commission coming in I don't know how many languages. And each country, as big or as small as it is, claims that its language, and even if it's Finnish, has to be taken into account in papers coming from the EU Commission. Sorry if someone comes from Finland. <laughs> um, but, but that, of course, limits the growth, and therefore companies who do, you know, a company like, like a case text would be great for German lawyers to have that, because I think this really moves things forward, or that what you are doing with, with Ross. But you need people who, who do it not for the money, you know, who invent things and develop things not for the money. If you just do it for the money, you wouldn't do it. It's too small. Yeah. Well, sort of segueing into that, a lot of this because of I mean, with regard to technology, it's interesting to see that I, 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 would, I would focus on two points, diversity and technology. With regard to technology, for them, technology is a given. It's, you know, they would not go to a law firm which does not use technology, not because they are nerds or want to have an iPad or so. Technology is a proxy for flexible working and not doing the boring stuff. So this is a generation of people who says there must be an app for that. You, you can't motivate these people to sift through folders of documents. They want to go to a law firm which really looks for, for apps or for technology doing this so that these people can do interesting things. A and B, technology allows them not to sit in the office but to work where they are and have a more flexible family work life. That's with regard to technology. So a, a law firm which says technology doesn't play a major role with us, I would say good luck with, with regard to recruiting. Second, diversity. For us, diversity at the moment is something where we develop, it's like learning to walk. You know, that we realize the way we law firms deal with, uh, deal with diversity it doesn't have a future with 10% of female partners in your rank. That's completely weird. And this generation, for them, if you talk about, with them about diversity, they just don't understand what you're talking about. They would say, how on earth you could work in a non-diverse environment? I mean, they, in, in these international classes, you have people from all sorts of countries and mixtures and peoples, and, and I don't know how many genders are there, but they, <laughs> they grow up in an environment which is by nature diverse. And if we tell them, well, in law firms, they, so they really work hard to increase their female percentage of partners, they look at you and <laughs> they, they don't. I mean, they expect management being diverse and not just saying they are diverse. They want to have all sorts of gender, races, ethnical, cultural, and you name it, reflected in management. Um, and I see certain issues of traditional law firms in this generation, so there will be a, a culture clash. Well, don't know how hard, but there will be a clash. You. I want to come back to the, the law school uh, one and the question about this area. You know, on the one hand, you talk about this area and a number of the initiatives represented by folks at this conference, Ryerson, we've talked about uh, uh, the, the graph that shows a lot of the innovation, but the other side of the coin is, 
you know, you can point to Europe, and maybe this is also true of Latin America, and, and, and really name only one or two really innovative sort of tech-focused uh, uh, law schools that have that, maybe private or quasi-private. Mm -hmm. So you could say about Spain, wow, it's really developing innovation, but the laser beam is on IE Madrid, started by Canada, but, but now Ryerson's all the rage. Of course, Bucer is in, in, in Germany, and, and the UK is more complicated. So if the other side of the coin is, you, you are destabilized, Bucerius and those institutions are, are, are setting out a footprint to really do innovative stuff, but they're, they're facing this behemoth, right, of dozens, in some cases, hundred years of tradition from the big public law schools who, you know, where they have most of the alums who are in, in the sector. I doubt Toronto is quaking in its boots about Ryerson. I doubt the great German law, uh, law schools are quaking in their boots. So, how do you see innovation in that? In that is that going to take a hundred years? Um, it's well. It it started with Butzerius only. You now see many groups of students and um, and lectures on technology in other very traditional uh, universities. Yeah. Munich, for example, <laughs> Münster, and and uh, you have it in Cologne. And I, I get calls, and then I go to other universities and then give speeches. It is a bit like. So things are moving. It's not only Bucerius, and for us, it was always important to sort of export it and not be, not only have legal tech at Bucerius. That's nice to start with, but that's not sustainable. Um, but changing a curriculum, and it, it's a bit like here, you know, like the ABA uh, accreditation and state requirements, and how innovative can you be in a university? Um, that'll take time, but the German justice ministers have now built up a working group dealing with legal technology with a focus to how to regulate it. And we said, whether you want to regulate it or not, the good thing is that you start to look at it. And we would expect that technology will play a part in the university curricula because for a very simple reason, if you, if you require lawyers to work with technology which has market standard like e-discovery or document review or all the other things, and there are people who do not understand what they're doing, how can you be an ethical lawyer if you work with a tool which you don't understand? How can you sell the result of something where you don't know how it came together? So you have to train people in order to maintain a certain ethical level for those people and leave alone judges who maybe at some time in Germany will deal with software which makes a recommendation which says Markus Hartung should go to jail because he fits a certain pattern. Um, so we have to train people to that. And Germans sometimes tend to be, I mean, we all want to, we are looking for the holy grail, but sometimes we are pragmatic. And at the moment, it seems to me that a bit more pragmatism is taking place. On that note, uh, if you, if you have other questions, maybe Marcus will be a, around for a little bit. You can talk to him then. Join, please join me in thanking Marcus for this.